How did that change the whole nature of the study of culture? Previous to that, we had people who studied mass culture, uh, leading people like white and uh, the practice group. Uh, in what way did the focus shift with the introduction of these new uh, ideas? That's, that's an important question, and I think that's a history that is yet to be written, but it's very clear that the big debate in the mid-60s that centered first on the New Left Review was whether or not there was going to be a native British or Anglo-American tradition that would emerge as the dominant mode for cultural study, or if European literary and cultural theory would play a central role or even dominate. And, of course, what happened in the days of New York Review, in the move from Raymond Williams and E.P. Thompson and Stuart Hall to the later 60s, when Perry Anderson and others began to take over European theory, was that French and German theory, especially Frankfurt School theory, began to predominate on the Anglo-American scene as well. So I think one, one contribution that communication studies made by introducing British cultural studies through an American context was to emphasize an American nativist tradition and also to maintain the centrality of a British tradition because it was not the French or the Germans who were invited to Illinois and who later were addressed specifically in the work of James Carey and others in communication studies department. It was the British and also some American pragmatists, Dewey and others. So in that respect, I think the way in which American cultural studies developed in the late 60s and early 70s turned out to be very different from British cultural studies. Unlike British cultural studies, i.e. the radicalizing of the New Left Review under Perry Anderson, we didn't turn to European theory until much later. In communication studies, mm -hmm. so, uh, one of the specialty is Orwell. Uh, what role did Orwell specifically play in the whole development of an interest in popular culture and cultural studies? One of his great influences, I think, had been to legitimize the study and the uh, public sharing among intellectuals of popular culture as something that could be talked about, written about, and could be the object of an open expression of affection. And he has several essays in which he addresses his own great affection for popular culture and talks about how from his earliest boyhood he had immersed himself in boys newspapers like the gem and the magnet and so on and several of his novels like coming up for air and tiki asked for this reflying reflect his immersion in popular literature and comic books and popular songs and the penny postcards and the vaudeville musical yeah and i think much of this is attached to a kind of nostalgia for his own Edwardian boyhood that you later see also reflected in some of the nostalgic writings of Raymond Williams and Richard Hoggett in the late 50s in culture and society and the uses of literacy. I would say that above all, he liberated intellectuals to address something more than simply high culture. And in doing that, he was able to convey the great love that he had of popular culture without any of the guilt that some intellectuals were feeling during the period for really liking that stuff but not being able to admit it openly and certainly not being able to write about it. And I think too as a, as a mode, however unsystematic is criticism, however impressionistic by some standards of theoretical discourse today, he also contributed by inaugurating the idea that we didn't need a separate aesthetics 
for popular mass culture. Instead, one could simply use the tools of high culture analysis and apply them when needed to different kinds of popular culture artifacts. So it was a very task-oriented criticism that he introduced, and he simply would write about the boys' newspapers in the same way that he'd write about a popular novelist, and to some extent even about a well-known novelist, high culture status like Joyce or Lyon. So in that respect, I think he also had a big influence. Mary McCarthy made the famous remark in the late 60s that George Orwell virtually invented popular culture studies as a domain of activity worthy of intellectual pursuits. And she was speaking for her generation, his generation, of Anglo-American intellectuals. So I think that there's a recognition among literary intellectuals that Orwell pioneered popular culture studies of an anti-theoretical or non-theoretical sort. He was the one who first admitted that he loved the stuff and that it was of sufficient sociological and cultural importance that it was worthy, indeed necessary, of study. And so despite the fact, or even because of the fact, that he's very much an old-fashioned literary intellectual who never claimed that popular culture had any great aesthetic merit. On the other hand, he contributed to the decision of intellectuals and then later academics to make popular culture a subject of study because he always stressed its immense sociological importance. And that, of course, in the later 60s and 70s, was no longer considered to be an adequate claim by the 60s and 70s, many people were claiming that popular art was just as good or even better in many respects as traditional high art. Orwell never went that far. So in many ways, he's an intellectual of his day. He subscribed to the old Arnoldian idea that culture is the criticism of life and literary culture is the highest form of artistic expression. From the standpoint of some avant-garde intellectuals of the 60s and 70s who are exalting happenings and Andy Warhol and the Beatles and so on. These were the partisan review intellectuals among whom Mary McCarthy associated. They had less affection for Orwell, but they always were faithful to the historical fact that it was because of his stress on the cultural and sociological significance of popular art that the first breakthrough was made. But also the political significance of popular culture and mm -hmm. uh, his involvement in trying to put out uh, a conflict. One of his ideas was that the left was humorous and that the left was also missing the boat when it came to exploiting the potential of popular culture for a left politics. And so he attempted to organize with the children's short story writer and the socialist Tribune contributor, Jeffrey Treese, a left-wing comic. And the project fell through, though he and Treese had even bought a printing press or arranged to buy a printing press that would handle the comic. This was in 1940-41 when he was searching around for work. So. He definitely believed that popular culture could have a liberating and populist thrust. And in a couple of his essays, he makes a critique of many of the papers that he had left, like the Chen and the Magnet, being owned by right-wing concerns, Lord Camrose and the inaugurated press, and said that the fact that they seemed to be owned by these interests, and always to reflect a sunny image of Britain circa 1910, before the Great War, and without any mention of class differences and so on, uh, was not surprising, and was certainly a way in which some conservative interests were being buttressed through popular culture.